Whistling Five Anarchic Productions proudly presents Stumpy Sanderson's 1970s Stories As told by Andrew Brammer Hello and welcome. The story you are about to hear is written and told using its original source materials. Scribblings and scratchings from the scrawls of Stumpy found within Stumpy Sanderson's time capsule, which was buried in 1979 and then unearthed in 2019. The story is told in the first person, as I, just like Stumpy, witnessed at first hand the momentous events which it recounts. So let's park up our rally choppers and tomahawks and take a ride back to 1973 for Bendy and the Snowball of Terror. It was finished on the Friday afternoon, just as the last of the week's blizzards had subsided, and it now stood visible in the distance, on the hilltop of that part of Blows Downs that could be seen from Bendy Henderson's house. A huge and sinister snowman, the largest we had ever seen, resembling some hideous cross between the Wicker Man and Frankenstein's monster. Its base was formed by a huge misshapen snowball, on which then sat another uneven snowball of lesser size, but which was still enormous, and which tapered off to give the beast a monstrous waistline. Two arms made of tree branches were raised as if in anger to the grey snow-filled sky, with large stone buttons, a bright red scarf, and then that dreadful face, with its cavernous and grotesque wide open mouth that seemed to be emitting a terrifying moan. Set off by two large pieces of irregular shaped coal as eyes, and the largest carrot we had ever seen, stuck in as its nose. As Stumpy Sanderson, Bendy Henderson and I each peered through our binoculars from our adventure kits, kneeling down at our vantage point from Bendy's front room windowsill, Bendy exclaimed, That monster must be ten feet high! Fifteen! hissed Stumpy. All two tons of him! No one knew at what ungodly hours or times this monstrosity had been built. For in the five days it had taken to be constructed, we had never once spotted anyone up on that hill during the day. Although admittedly, it sometimes would have been near impossible to sight anyone in the near whiteout conditions and heavy howling blizzards that had frequently blown and swirled for most of the last few days, and which had meant school being cancelled due to the constant failing of the boiler room based central heating system. And none of us had any idea who had built it, for this hideosity had clearly been created by maniacs' hands. But whose? What twisted minds with the hands of Orlac would have created such an abomination? We definitely knew, though, that whoever had constructed this had to be tall, strong, and numerous. For we all believed the creation of this awful sentinel was something even the builders of Stonehenge would have struggled with. Bendy had first spotted this creature's genesis on the Tuesday morning, when he had gone into his front room after he had finished his breakfast of puffer puffer rice, and had first spotted through the window a huge snowball, the base, sitting on the top of that hill. Although he considered it a bit peculiar, he had thought little more of it at the time. But then, on the Wednesday morning, Again after breakfast, Bendy, wearing his brand new fawn-coloured duffel coat, had braved the swirling snows along our street to make his way to first mine and then Stumpy's house 
to alert us to the startling news that this huge snowball he had first seen, and which until that point Stumpy and I had known nothing about, now had another one sitting on top of it. This staggering information immediately triggered mine and Stumpy's instincts that something sinister could indeed be afoot, and we all then headed back like Arctic explorers to Bendy's house to take our first views of this spectacle. At our first sighting, Stumpy and I could now see why Bendy had felt the need to alert us. How had it got there? How had such a mammoth sphere managed to be lifted onto that oversized base? What would happen next? We all agreed to watch and wait, and that if something extra was added to the construction by the next morning, we would need to start drawing up a plan of action. On the Thursday afternoon, when we all met up again, we knew something ominous was indeed happening, for a faceless and formless head now sat atop the body. And then, on that Friday afternoon, we clearly saw that those final hideous and sinister touches had been added. Those sinister spindly arms, the buttons and scarf and coal eyes and carrot nose, and of course, that horrible gaping mouth. What was even more sinister was that its gaze seemed to be staring right into Bendy's house. It was hard to explain, but we all felt that the arms seemed to be beckoning us and that the mouth was calling us. By some unnatural instinct, we all just knew that the monster had been built and constructed deliberately to look down on and into Bendy's house, to face us, to taunt us, to lure us. That thing gives me the heebie-jeebies, hissed Stumpy. We all agreed, but at the same time, we all just knew that it was our destiny that we would need to see this brute first hand, that we would have to come face to face with that behemoth which we just knew was calling to us. We need to plan this properly, but we have to see this thing up close. It's calling to us. It's been built for us. It means us no good. We need to destroy it, continued Stumpy. Agreed, we said, with a mixture of trepidation, anticipation and excitement. So it was on the late Saturday afternoon, as I was round Stumpy's, the heavy daily snows of the week having finally broken that morning, and then being replaced with a great drop in temperature, that Stumpy and I rang and told Bendy, we go tonight. Now, due to our ages, we all knew we had a strict time limit that we were allowed out until, and thus a very narrow window of opportunity for our mission. But Stumpy's parents were pretty liberal and laid back, and so he was always allowed out until nine o'clock. While I could also stretch to this, providing I said I was round his. Bendy, though, presented far more of a problem, and, having only just recently come out of his latest grounding by his strict Presbyterian father, for completely ruining his pair of brand new St Crispin trainers by getting his bone shaker bicycle stuck in the middle of a huge, foul and stagnant puddle of drain water under the Skimpot Road railway bridge, there was no way that he would be let out on a Saturday night, unless he could categorically say and prove that he would be round one of our houses. We duly exploited this chink of potentiality, as Stumpy told Bendy to tell his parents we were having a Sabutio tournament round his house, which Stumpy's own dad would be refereeing and overseeing. A complete pack of lies, but this did the trick, 
and Bendy gave us the OK that his father said yes, providing he was back home at 7.30 sharp. This meant things would be very tight indeed, dangerously so, and that we would be racing against the clock. But after some quick calculations we made on the back of a packet of guard cigarettes, we worked out we could get up the hill, see and destroy the snowman, and still be back in time for Bendy to meet his deadline. So, it was just while Stumpy and I were still watching the Basil Brush show, having fortified ourselves with a tasty mission fortifying tea of Finder's savoury pancakes, that Bendy knocked for us, and wearing our bobble hats, gloves, parkers and monkey boots, Bendy in his brand new fawn-coloured duffel coat, we stepped outside into the crisp white snow of the freezing night. Armed with our torches, we paid a quick visit to Stumpy's dad's shed, helping ourselves to a collection of what we thought would be useful tools, including a couple of shovels, a small pickaxe, and a small Calagas camping stove. With a poacher's moon hanging in the still, jet-black velvet sky, we then set off like Arctic paratroopers for our grim appointment. Our feelings a mixture of great adventure and also just a hint of potential doom. Making our way in silent routine up a private drive that led to the bottom of the downs, we climbed through the fencing, crossed the sparkling white-covered railway line, and then at the foothills of the huge snow-covered hill, had to take a wide detour where the farmer's cows usually gathered, and where, due to all the swirling winds of the week, the snow had not collected in great depth, instead leaving the rutted ground a mixture of wet and frozen mud and cow pats, streaked with furrows and mounds of yellow and green snow half-frozen rivers of green, yellow and brown water, and a vast reservoir of ominous-looking yellow and green glowing water that lay beneath a very thin covering of ice. As we now looked up at the enormous snowman that stood proud and forbidding in the light of the moon, beckoning to us, we three intrepid explorers set off for our cold climb. As we climbed, the freezing top layers of the snow cracking under us, the snow was deep, hindering our progress, slowing us down, so deep in places that Stumpy and me, being of extremely small stature, occasionally sank up to our midriffs. It was only Bendy, with his beanpole figure, who could cut an easy swathe through. Trying our very best to race against the clock and the deadline that Bendy had to be back home by, our inexorable and laborious climb continuing as we headed higher, our breath blowing clouds of cold steam. The only sounds are footsteps on the cracking snow. Stumpy suddenly stopped and hissed. There's something else up there. What? I've just seen movement, and look, there in the snow. And yes, coming from a different route to which we were taking, but which now converged and lay ahead of us, and going in the same direction up towards that terrible snowman, were unmistakably four sets of footprints. Stumpy continued, and whatever or whoever it is, they're wearing Doc Martin boots. Come on, we've got to get up there. But let's keep it quiet. Whoever it is up there, we can't let them know we're here. Stumpy hissed. Agreed. But Bendy, probably due to his long striding out, was flagging. I need a breather. I may be a while. Go on, I'll catch you up. So Stumpy and I pushed on our heads down in determined concentration, but just as we reached within twenty yards or so of that massive, 
imposing snowman. A great shout came from behind, from Bendy. It's moving! Stumpy and I looked up, startled, and then looked behind us, caught between wanting to yell to Bendy to keep his voice down and to hear better what he was shouting. He shouted again, The snowman! It's moving! Our gazes shot back to the huge grotesque, and yes, we could now clearly see its cyclopean form was indeed rocking, as if someone was pushing it. Then we heard voices from behind it, and then we saw them, as from each side of that great white form there appeared four members of the gang of our most fearsome and recurring foes, the Milton Sisters Gang. Led by those suede-headed Roman-nosed twins of terror, Mandy and Melanie Milton, and flanked by two of their accomplices, Slugger Carson and Tin Ribs Wilson. Hope you like snow, they shouted, and putting their considerable backs and shoulders into the effort, they all gave an almighty heave, and with a giant push, started to roll the snowman. At first, it moved slowly, and in the first few yards of its movement, the top of the ogre and all its appendages fell off, leaving just the huge snowball base itself rolling down the hill, monstrously moving towards us, slowly at first, but then its lumbering descent gathering a terrifying pace its oversized and terrifying form now bearing down on us, looming larger and larger, the dreadful splitting and cracking noise of the snow beneath it adding to our horror as we stood dumbfounded and rooted in terror. Suddenly galvanised into action, Stumpy shouted, Evasive action! And he darted and dived to the left, me to the right. But Bendy, who in later years would pretend he was the six million dollar man, and who was an avid follower since 1967 of all things Captain Scarlet, believed he was indestructible, and shouted, Don't worry lads, I've got this! And standing there, in his fawn-coloured duffel coat, he set his legs in a firm and steadfast stance, with his arms held out in front of him, readying himself to stop the snowball. Bendy, get out of the way! Stumpy and I shouted. But it was to no avail. Bendy's self-belief was insurmountable. A pipe cleaner figure, but now filled with the spirit of Hercules and Samson, Bendy readied himself to hold back that great snow boulder as it rolled faster and faster down that hill of doom. But Bendy, was more like King Canute, and the basic laws of physics dictate that a reedy figure cannot hold back a sphere of that massive size and pace. And, too late, as the looming colossus approached, Bendy realised the enormity and futility of his attempt, and in a split second, with his arms outstretched, the snowball rolled over him and flattened him. As the Milton sisters' gang roared with laughter and in lightning speed, Stumpy's and mine emotions swung from horror and dread to hope. For as the great orb completed a roll, we saw that, somehow and miraculously, Bendy was holding on. We cheered. Hold on, Bendy, you can do it. Down that hill the snowball careered, and with every rotation we saw Bendy appear at the top of the giant snowball and then disappear from view. The weight of that massive ball must have been horrendous, but still Bendy held on, the pace of the globoid gathering and gathering, a great careering monster. But then Stumpy and I both looked in horror as we realised that the only way that misshapen snowball was going to stop would be when it hit the large area of level ground at the foothills. That rutted area that the cows usually occupied, and which was a mixture of wet and frozen land, filled with green and yellow snow and frozen cow pats, foul-running rivers of acidic yellow, green and brown waters, 
and that vast reservoir of yellow and green water protected only by a thin covering of ice. With the laughs of the Milton sisters' gang cackling in our ears, we tried to wade down the hill, desperately shouting to Bendy that he had to let go and get off. But it was too late. And the enormous ill-shaped spinning ball hit those foothills, splashing its way through like some giant meteor, hitting those green, yellow and brown rivers, sending up great plumes of foul water, rotating and submerging Bendy into the reeking mire as he still clung to the ball's form. It's slowing up, shouted Stumpy. It's stopping. And, thankfully, we saw that the giant snowball had still continued its rotation, with Bendy now back in view. But while the spheroid's great progress was indeed grinding to a halt, we watched in horror as it now came juddering to a standstill over that foul and vast reservoir of green and yellow awfulness. And then, with a great cracking and splintering of the thin ice that covered this foulness, the ball dropped a couple of feet into the radioactive looking liquid, the gigantic snowball's form itself now glowing yellow and green in the moonlight. With the momentum now ground to a halt, and after a few seconds, Bendy, who was still just about hanging on to the top of the giant snowball, slowly slid down like a flattened milk snake, and with arms still outstretched, sank head first into that shallow and dreadful lake of green and yellow. As Stumpy and I approached, and after long minutes, Bendy slowly and painfully rose. Like some heroic toxic beanpole, soaked, bedraggled, and battle-scarred, groaning and spluttering, and spitting out a mouthful of we knew not what, stunned and in bad shape, his slightly goofy teeth were protruding, his milk bottle glasses askew, and with one lens broken, his new fawn-coloured duffel coat, covered in yellow and green reeking slush and acidic liquid, indelibly stained and ruined. His Timex watch with its strap broken, hanging off his wrist, and which showed we had less than ten minutes to get him back home before the strict deadline of 7.30pm that his father had set. With the hyena cackling of the Milton sisters' gang ringing closer in our ears, Stumpy and I both horribly realised that we had all been right all along. That that snowman had been built for us. It had called to us. It had meant us no good. And now, that snowman of terror, which had been started on the Monday and finished on the Friday, would now undoubtedly result when he got back home and was seen by his strict Presbyterian father in the finishing of Bendy on this cold and frozen and infamous Saturday. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stumpy Sanderson's 1970s Stories. And don't forget to listen out for Stumpy and Gang's next adventure. For further information on all things Stumpy Sanderson, please visit www.stumpysanderson.co.uk And you can also check out the Stumpy Sanderson's 1970s Stories YouTube channel. But before we saddle up again on our rally choppers and tomahawks, Let's take a listen to the strange little song that was specially written by Stumpy to accompany this podcast's tale.
This song is performed for us now by Stumpy Sanderson's 1970s acoustic archive. Let's rock! One cold winter As the snow lay So deep On the ground A sinister snowman Sat on a hilltop And surveyed All around And like The wicker man it stood silently and watched Frozen malevolence Primed and ready To light a torch And it had been Made just from a snowball By Frankenstein Hands Maniacs thinking Behind his construction In that snow-filled Land And never Play With yellow snow Cause you don't Know What makes it glow And never pick up so the screen Cause you don't know where it's been Snowball, snowman, snowball Giant snowball, snowball, snowman, snowball, giant snowball, snowball, snowman, snowball, giant snowball, snowball, snowman. Snowball, giant snowball, it's a lie, it's a lie. 